we're today we're still walking through those first few paragraphs of on sense and reference and on Monday we'll move on to John Settle's article proper names so please keep trying to do this thing of um, do the reading uh, come to the lecture do the reading go to the section do the reading um, it will all come I, I mean partly because in lecture I'm not going to cover absolutely everything in the reading and also you may think I'm getting it not quite right about the reading there's room for perfectly reasonable disagreement here um, so try to keep keying everything back to doing the reading um, so uh, our basic problem in these first few weeks is how do signs get hooked up to objects how do terms get hooked up to the concrete objects that we're talking about? Um, and I want to begin by, looking, by remarking that there seem to be lots of different kinds of terms that get hooked up to objects. Different kinds of singular term, a singular term being a term that gets hooked up to an object. And uh, Frege says that it's sense that connects the name to the object, the sign to the object. And he makes a number of remarks about what sense is. It's really a difficult notion, this. Um, and one thing he does is he contrasts sense with ideas. So we'll spend a little while looking at that contrast. Um, and then go on to look at what he does positively say about what sense is. The question I said was, how does a singular term be tied up to an object? But on the face of it, there are lots of different kinds of singular terms, terms of sound for objects. And uh, it's not obvious you're going to get the same answer for all singular terms. And what are singular terms? What are the terms of sound for objects? This is kind of more or less at random. Um, you know, Sally, California, the moon. These are what you'd ordinarily call proper names. Yeah? These are like names of things. You get demonstrative terms which are kind of general purpose, like this and that. Excuse me a moment. <laughs> Excuse me a moment. Okay. <laughs> so demonstratives like this and that, they can be used to refer to practically anything. And they seem quite different to the names, where each name has a fixed designation. Um, and then there are descriptions, like the tall man who called earlier, the point, Frege's example, the point of intersection of A and B, um, the person sitting ex to the extreme right of the class. Also, the king of the West Saxons, the candy-colored tangerine flake streamline baby. Um, so there are lots and lots of definite descriptions. And again, these seem to work in a different way to terms like demonstratives like this and that, uh, or names like Sally. And on the face of it, um, Frege is saying they all work the same way. They all get hooked up to the object by way of a sense. Um, and it's natural to wonder, is that right? Is, is, are there really a uniform category here? Um, one basic contrast we have to keep in mind is a contrast that, if you've done logic, will be very familiar to you, but is, is very simple, but it's very hard to keep in place. It's the distinction between a singular term and a general term. So if you say Sally is tall, how many pieces are there in that sentence? I say, you get two pieces. You get the Sally piece, and you got the is tall piece. And the Sally stands for, let us say, Sally. Right? Stands for an object. But does the is tall bit stand for an object? No! The is tall bit does not stand for an object. Which object could it be? The whole point about the is tall bit is that it's a general term. It can apply to many, many different things. Yeah? It can be applied to you or to me. It might be true in one case, false in the other. But the whole thing about a general term is that, as you can see, it has this convenient slot in it so that it can take in that slot the names of endlessly many different particular things. Sally, Bob, whatever. Yeah? That all right? We will come back to this many times. It's really an important point. 
um, the distinction between a singular term and a general term. So when we're talking about how terms get hooked up to objects, we are only talking about the singular terms at this point. I mean, just to see how it's hard to keep in place, um, look at that definite description. I said that's a singular term, right? The tall man who called earlier. That's all right. That was a singular term, right? That specifies a particular object. Yes? But let me put it to you. That tall, didn't we just say tall was general? How come a general term's in there? What's going on? Uh huh. Is that the man that is tall is taller than like people that are usually? Men? Yeah, that's what that means. This is a man, a man who is taller than um, people you, than men usually are. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, but okay, but how come there's a general term in there? Yeah, I agree, the upshot is a singular term. Yep. Well, there kind of a few general terms in there, and by putting them together, you make a specific term. Yeah. Possibilities that by statistics. Statistics, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I see, yeah. You narrow it down. Yeah, there must be something to There must be something to both of these. Yeah, there was one other person. Uh, was it you? Yeah, if that's a singular term, what's a general term doing in there? Yeah. Uh, so just one, two, yeah. Yeah, that tall man. Yeah, um, you might say that tall man, but someone might say, yeah, but he's not really tall. Yeah. So you referred despite the general term not applying. Is that right? Is that, is that what you mean? When you say that tall man. And you say, he wasn't really tall, he just seemed tall. You were scared. <laughs> <laughs> It is almost like a name, I agree, yeah. But the thing is, these names seem to manage fine without a general term in them, Sally in California. Yeah. I just want to raise this question at this point, yeah. Uh, uh, but okay, the, the, uh, say one more thing, <laughs> sum it up. No, say that, sum up the main point, say the same thing again. Can you say the same, the same thing again? Make your point one more time. You are using this like a name, that's right, in that it stands for a particular object, yeah. But the thing I'm saying in response is that very often names don't manage without general terms in them. Yeah. So if it's just like a name like Sally, it's kind of surprising there's a general term in there. Uh, last one. Yeah, so there isn't really a general term in here. Yeah, that's kind of a radical view, but yeah, that, 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 that's a reasonable response. Yeah. Okay, we will spend a lot of time on this, but at the moment I just want you guys to think about this. Uh, yeah, what, what, what is the contrast here? Okay, so here's Frege's general take. Um, a proper name, a word, a sign, a sign combination or expression expresses its sense and stands for or designates its reference. Um, by means of a sign, we express its sense and designate its reference. So anyone who understands speech at all knows that sometimes the signs stand for something. The existence of sense is something you only spot when you start thinking about informative versus uninformative identities, like we did last time. Um, and then when you think through uh, what sense must be doing for sameness of sense to make an identity 
uninformative, then you realize the sense must be determining the reference. Yeah? So sense is kind of elusive, um, but it really seems to be doing a lot of work. It's not obvious that you can refer to sense at all. Um, I mean, could we actually have sense as an object of study? Could you refer to senses and think about them? Um, John Searle had an old example designed to say, well, you can't really... I mean, remember I was showing these pictures of a shed from different angles and saying, you got this take on it, you got that take on it. Well, it's a question, how could you refer to the take itself? The take seems, how should I say, somehow insubstantial. It's only there in your relation to the object. So if I have my take on the computer from over here, and my take on the computer from over there, well, I can refer to the computer and thereby express the take both times. But referring to the take itself, could you do that? Um, Sarah had this example of, I couldn't get a picture that exactly matches his description, but he had a description of a construction with lots of glass tubes in it. And uh, these glass tubes um, have got targets at the bottom of them. And sometimes you've got a pair of glass tubes that lead to the same object at the base. So when you drop a ball in to one of the glass tubes, that is like using a sign to refer to an object. And sometimes you get two glass tubes hooking up to the same object. Yeah? So the glass tube is like your, the way your ball gets to the target. The glass tube is like the sense. Yeah? That makes sense? Um, if, you see, if you see what I mean. Yeah? Yeah? Um, so if you're thinking of sense like that, it's the way that your sign gets to the object, then how could you refer to the glass tube itself? I mean, there's no such thing as a glass tube suddenly landing on a glass tube. Every time you drop a ball in, the thing goes all the way down to the concrete object. You can't really refer to the sense. You see what I mean? There's a way I've got of talking about the computer right now. I can express that by saying that computer. And you can kind of get on. You can imagine how I'm getting the computer. But referring to the, the take itself, does that really make sense? And it's an elusive idea, this notion of sense. So anyway, there is a path from sign to sense to reference. And as our old friend Rumpelstiltskin makes clear, there is no path backwards. Yeah? That I think is where we got to. Yeah? Any, anything about that? The regular connection between a sign, its sense, and its reference is of such a kind that to the sign there corresponds a definite sense and to that in turn a definite reference while to a given reference, to a given object, there does not belong only a single sign. That's the thing about no path backwards. Yeah? Um, now, there are a couple of um, obvious qualifications you have to make this about this. Sometimes a sign can be ambiguous. Right? There, might be many, there are many different people called Sally. So a sign can express many different senses and uh, uh, refer to many different objects in different contexts. And there's also a puzzle about, aren't there singular terms that don't refer? Don't you sometimes get a sign with a sense, but no reference? You know, as you might say to me, there's no such person as Sally. She is just a figment of your imagination. Um, one of your many imaginary friends. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that can happen. It happens to other people, right? Um, <laughs> you have singular terms that don't refer. They make sense, but they don't refer. Yeah. Aha, uh -huh. how come we can talk about unicorns and dragons? Well, yeah. I mean, speaking, because there's a common accepted version of the word. Version, yeah. Would that be the same thing as a sense? I mean, if you said the term like unicorn has a sense, but no reference, 
Does that catch it? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm agreeing. I'm assuming, unless you know something I don't, that there are no such things as unicorns, <laughs> r r right? Yeah. Uh, so I'm assuming there's no reference. Yeah, so there's nothing concrete for it to refer to. So there is no such... There are no unicorns. I mean, nobody's too shattered by this. There are no unicorns, <laughs> r r r right? Yeah. Um, but still, the sign means something. I'm going to put this. You know what it would be for there to be a unicorn? If, if one came up, you would know what that was, all right. Yeah? Um, so it's got some kind of meaning. You might say it's got a sense, but no reference. Yeah? Is that? But that's kind of, I think that's a natural interpretation of what's going on here. Well, again, we'll come back to that. That's an important question. Yeah? Could an, could an idea be a reference? Could an idea be a reference? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk a bit in a minute about what an idea is when Frege talks about it. But um, if you take something like a pain, a pain could be a reference, right? If I talk about a headache, yeah, you know, I, I describe to you in great detail. I say it's a kind of dull, throbbing, heavy kind of headache. It's not really a sharp pain. And it seems like I'm really identifying a particular thing there, the headache, yeah? Um, if I'm a connoisseur of pain, I might tell you quite a lot about this particular pain or that particular pain, yeah? Um, and I guess it's the same with if I get a sensation of redness, I could tell you it's a, a, a pulsating creamy red. Yeah, it seems like I'm talking about a particular sensation. And uh, is that right? Um, I, I don't know. I, I was thinking about more in, uh, in relation to what she, she was saying that perhaps instead of saying it's the sense of being a coin to which. Uh, that Meg's talking about unicorns possible, that there is, uh, as you oh. say, a, like, you know, each person has an internal representation or something of a unicorn, and it's that which they refer when they speak about I see. I, I didn't guess that. I didn't get that was what you were after, right? So you could be referring to your unicorn sensations. Um, sensations, well, uh, sensations as they come from the outside world. I, I feel like when we say sensations, we might be like, seeing them, which may not be a property of imagination that you actually see the things that you're talking about. But you might, it, it might lead that if you can refer to ideas that you don't need, um, uh, like an experience of it in particular that in the outside world in order to uh, re refer to something. Yeah. Um, again, that's an important suggestion. Um, the, the idea would be when you take a term like unicorn, it does refer to something all right. Namely, it refers to your inner sensations, the sensations you have when you imagine a unicorn or something like that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the idea. Yeah, um, that's an important idea, but um, straight off, it doesn't sound right. Because straight off, if the reference of unicorn was a sensation, you would have to say unicorns do exist. You, you see what I mean? It's just that all they are is sensations. Um, Everything so exists. Things that like, have like a, uh, like a physical makeup, or just things that uh, you can have an idea of? Uh, not everything you can have an idea of exists, r right? Right, right, yeah. Um, I mean, I can have an idea of a spider dancing in my hand, r right? Right, um, yeah. uh, But we wouldn't say that spiders don't exist, and we wouldn't say that dancing doesn't exist. No, but this one doesn't exist. I, I hope, <laughs> right? Look, it doesn't exist, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah th th that's the price you'd pay for that way of talking. You'd have to say unicorns do exist after all. Yeah. yeah. And that's what seems better about saying it's got a sense but not a reference. Yeah. Straight off, th 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 these are complex questions. Okay, so there's varieties of singular term. Yeah. Just a first run through, we'll spend a lot more time on this. Okay, ideas. Any anything else in this first? Okay. Ideas. Frege says, well, when Frege is talking about an idea, he means something that's in your stream of consciousness, something that's going through your mind, something like the sensation. 
And one striking thing he says is, we did this thing about informative and uninformative identities, where he said, that shows there's such a thing as sense. Sense must be what fixes reference. But then let's go back and say, well, what is sense then, if it's fixing reference? Um, and he says, well, we have to distinguish the sense from anything that's in your stream of consciousness. As you're talking, as you understand what I say, as I understand what you say, you're grasping the senses all right. But the sense itself is not something running through your stream of consciousness. Um, the reference and sense of a sign are to be distinguished from the associated idea. So this is a strong um, rejection of that last suggestion that the sense or reference of the word unicorn might be a sensation. He's denying that. Um, he says, if the reference of a sign is an object perceivable by the senses, if it's something like that computer or that light, then um, my idea of it, the thing that runs through my stream of consciousness, is an internal image arising from my memories of sense impressions which I've had, and acts both internal and external, which I performed. So I've got my whole track, track history with the dear old computer, which has served me so well. Um, and uh, uh, I have all my memories, but none of that is the sense. He says, a painter, a horseman, and a zoologist will probably connect different ideas with the name Bucephalus. As we all know, Bucephalus was the horse of Alexander the Great. Um, this is a 13-year-old Alexander the Great taming the great beast. Um, I just thought you'd like to know that. Um, <laughs> So this is a very famous horse, um, allegedly buried in failure in Pakistan, which is named after it. Um, uh, but all these people, the painter, the horseman, the zoologist, um, all will have different sensations, different internal impressions associated with the name. Nonetheless, they all interpret it in the same way, despite all these differences and associations. A sign sense can be the common property of many, and therefore is not a part or mode of the individual mind. People have talked about Bucephalus literally for centuries, actually literally for millennia. Um, so uh, they've all been talking about the same thing and talking about it in the same way. That's how civilization is possible, right? That you have a common store of thoughts being communicated from generation to generation. So sense can't be something that's individual to a particular mind. Sense must be something objective. One can hardly deny that mankind has a common store of thoughts which is transmitted from generation to generation. So we have to understand sense as having to do with that common store, that objective way uh, that way of thinking about the world that is objectively available, the same for you and me. If uh, meaning was all about internal sensation, then communication would presumably be impossible. Your internal sensations being quite different from mine. Since communication does seem to be possible, sense must be something objective. So we have to distinguish it from the individual's idea. It says, someone who observes the moon through a telescope. Well, consider here we have someone observing the moon. Here we have the moon itself. And here we have the telescope. You, fo fo you following me here? Okay. So he's, Frege says, I compare the moon itself to the reference. Right, so the moon itself is what you're thinking about. Um, the moon is the object of the observation mediated by the real image projected by the object glass somewhere in the interior of the telescope, right? So there's a real image of the moon somewhere in the middle of the telescope. And then there's the retinal image that the particular observer is having, the particular image of one observer rather than another. And he says, well, the image on the um, uh, object glass is like the sense. The image in the middle of the telescope is like the sense. The, the moon is a reference. The image in here is like the sense. And um, the idea or experience is like the retinal image. 
The retinal image is idiosyncratic. It varies from person to person. The image in the object glass, the optical image in the telescope, is one-sided and dependent on the standpoint of observation. So it's only a particular take on the object. It's only a particular perspective on the object. But it's still objective in as much as it can be used by many observers. Yeah? So that's the, the picture of what's going on in communication. There's this thing that we can all use, that thing like this, like the optical image. Um, uh, and it is only a perspective-dependent take on the object, but it's perfectly objective. Everyone can use it and have the same one. So he's saying the sense of a term can be one-sided and dependent on the standpoint of observation, but it still has to be objective. So what is it? And can you say what it is? The sense of a term. That's the puzzle. If all this has made perfect sense, you should know pretty well now what... You should have it triangulated, what the sense is. But can you say anything more? I mean, what is the sense of a name like Bill Clinton? It is like the image in a telescope. Well, all right. Yeah? Um, with Bucephalus, uh, the idea is, I think the idea is, everyone's using it in the same sense. So when the um, painter and the horseman and the zoologist um, are all using the name, they all understand each other perfectly well. Communication is entirely possible. Yeah? So the, um, the painter might be saying to the horseman, would Bucephalus have had a saddle? What kind of saddle? You see what I mean? Would, it, would that be a horse with broad shoulders or a horse with narrow shoulders? So they're talking about the same thing. They communicate just fine. So the sense is exactly the same. The horseman, however, thinking about Bucephalus, may have all kinds of images of riding over rough ground, of um, charging into the enemy or ahead of a, a troop or whatever, right? Um, the painter, um, having presumably a more placid take on it, might have a lot of images of... Um, um, cadmium red or um, you know different kinds of brown or uh, whatever yeah uh, uh, so there may be quite different things going on in the streams of consciousness as they talk about Bucephalus yeah. does that help is that addressing the question that's right they are talking about the same reference that's right It's harder to get a fix on. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, but the point is, you only get a fix in the reference by way of the sense. That was the point about informative and uninformative identities. Since some identities involving Bucephalus are informative and some are not, there must be the sense that is what is letting you access the reference. Yeah. Um, and let me give you just one other example. Suppose that Bill is a friend of yours and a friend of mine. Um, but um, we have quite different relations. You really like Bill. Um, Bill. Bill's name fills me with rage and resentment. Um, so that um, when um, ever you mention the name Bill, I get this um, complex reaction of fear and hatred. Um, now, you don't get any of that. You just quite like Bill, uh, right? So when you and I talk about Bill, um, you are getting this pleasurable glow and I am getting this complex of rage and um, fear. And um, uh, our, our experiences are quite different on hearing something to do with the name. But just intuitively, that difference doesn't mean there's any problem about communication or who we're talking about. Yeah? There can be lots of variation there in your sensations on hearing a name. But the communication is just not affected. Yeah? The, yep. What's wrong with that? <laughs> You've got, yeah? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I guess, I, I mean, I get, I get your point, but where does the, uh, where does the sense come in, come in there? Like, how does the, 
how does the notion of sense help us here? Because it's just kind of like you were saying, you know, it seems like you're referring to the same reference and then you have your own, you have your own private idea of it, but, you know, with sign and reference, you seem okay. But why, why how, how does sense help us here? Okay, but th th this, is why, this is why I spent so long on the informative, uninformative yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Because, <laughs> right? Right, because that's really basic. You've yeah. got to have that distinction between informative and uninformative, and um, that doesn't have to do with what sensations you're having. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I could get over it about Bill, yeah. but it's not like I've got an informative identity. Yeah, Bill was actually Fred. That, that's not what happened. You, you see what I mean? Okay, okay. others. It's gone away. Okay? Okay. Um, so how are we going to say what sense is? Well, what happens in Frege is, um, go back to this contrast between kinds of singular term, names, demonstratives, um, descriptions. Um, whenever if it, uh, push comes to shove and Frege has to say what the sense of a name is, what he does is, he gives you a definite description. That's to say, when he's asked, well, what is the sense of Aristotle? How do you specify the sense of the name Aristotle? He says, well, the sense of the name Aristotle is something like this. The teacher of Alexander the Great, who was born in Stagira. I call that a definite description because, um, well, kind of intuitively, it's talking about somebody definite, of a particular person. And it's giving you a kind of characterization of them, describing them, the teacher of Alexander the Great who was born in Stagira. Yeah. So when it comes down to it, when Frege has got to say what the sense of a name is, he always specifies a description. Um, he talks about uh, this example as, uh, 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 in those few paragraphs, he says the point, uh, if you take A to be this line, B to be this line, to be this line from the mid from the midpoint to the vertex, or if you see what I mean of each opposing side, and he says, well, here's an informative identity. The point of intersection of A and B is the same as the point of intersection of B and C, um, and that's an informative identity. You get the same point being presented in two different ways, and he takes it for granted that since you get different descriptions here, you get different senses different ways of being given the same point. Um, so the general picture is a name is getting tied up to an object by being associated with a sense. And when it comes down to it and you say, well, what's a sense? What you always get is a description. So it looks like in this picture, a name is always being hooked up to the object by being associated oh. with a description. So there's got to be some description associated with Bucephalus that's been the same through the generations something like that. And that description that fixes the reference can be the same even though all our associated sensations are different. So in the case of Aristotle, you've got that name and it's getting hooked up to the object by the description, the teacher of Alexander the Great who was born in Stagira. Um, so that way of doing it, that, I mean, that has many merits because you can see how there could be different descriptions picking out the same object. Um, as in the, this case, you get different descriptions picking out the same thing. Um, and it does seem to be objective. But what's going on here is that we're explaining how names refer by having them associated with definite descriptions. But then the next question is, how do descriptions refer? The descriptions are picking out an object all right. How do they work? Descriptions are being taken to be more basic than names. You get names like Bill Clinton, Sally California, and so on. And it's being assumed that you could have a language without any names in it and just descriptions. And then you bring in names as kind of shorthand for descriptions, something like that. So it's being assumed that descriptions are more fundamental than names in this picture. Now, there is a puzzle, too, about this that, um, after all, with, uh, with names like of controversial people like Bill Clinton or Mitt Romney or whatever, your descriptions, the descriptions you associate with the name might be quite different to the descriptions I associate with the name. There's room for a lot of variation there. 
This is Frege, he says, In the case of an actual proper name, such as Aristotle, opinions as to the sense might differ. I mean, you might, after all, take it not to be, um, whatever it was, the teacher of Alexander the Great who was born in Stagira, but the pupil of Plato and the teacher of Alexander the Great. That's a different description. Anybody who does this, anybody who associates that description with the name, will attach another sense to the sentence, Aristotle was born in Stagira, then will a man who takes as the sense of the name, the teacher of Alexander the Great who was born in Stagira. You see what he means? Yeah, there's room for variation in what description you associate with a name. And Frege says sternly, um, so long as the reference remains the same, such variations of sense may be tolerated, although they are to be avoided in the theoretical structure of a demonstrative science and ought not to occur in a perfect language. So the idea is that, you, you know, this happens all right, but it's kind of regrettable and it's, it's just a sign of how slack we are in our use of names, that we have these same names with different descriptions associated with them. Right, because it's kind of obvious that can be, um, uh, that happens the whole time, right? I mean, you have a friend who you know, you know as the organizer of some society, um, I know them um, in some other capacity. We have quite different descriptions associated with them. Um, but uh, uh, the name still has, stands for the object all right. It just happens the whole time. Anybody who you have in co friends in common with, um, you and your friends might have quite different descriptions associated with them. Yeah? With their name. Uh, okay. <laughs> One, two, three. Oh, four. <laughs> right. um, okay, so it seems to me that there could be, in this, in this description, an infinite number of senses, but that seems to not be what I got, what I read for, or even want to say. You say that there'd only be sort of a few different senses that people could take, but I see infinite number of senses that lead to the same reference. Okay, infinite's a lot. I mean, um, no, I uh, <laughs> you, you, you mean something like there could be, uh, there's only two descriptions here picking out Aristotle, but there really could be lots more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that's completely fair. And I'm, I'm not sure, infinite's really a lot, right? <laughs> but there could be hundreds anyway. So, but, yeah. but then I also don't understand why the horseman and the painter and the zoologist would have different ideas but the same sense. Wouldn't they just have different senses? Uh, well, um, if you identify sense with the description you associate with the name, yeah, yeah, yeah then the, the, then variation in that is one thing, and variation in the sensations or images or emotional reactions you have is quite different. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm sorry, I forget what order I said. Um, were you two? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. That's very good, yeah. So doesn't that variation, can I put it like this? Doesn't that variation in associated description threaten the objectivity of sense? Threaten the possibility of communication? I think that's right. I, I think that's a real concern for this picture. Um, I think what Frege has in mind is that if uh, what really mattered for the meaning and fixing the reference to the sign was the individual sensations then you could never know whether you were talking about the same thing as I was. Yeah? It would be just impossible because you couldn't really peek into my mind and see which particular sensations I associated. Yeah? Um, but with descriptions, you at any rate can get things out in the open. It is in principle possible that you could say, oh, that's who you mean by John. You know, that's the description you associate. That could be completely public and out there. Um, to be discussed, 
Yeah. What is a sensation? It's being hidden in the recesses of the mind. You couldn't really ever make that public. I think that's what he has in mind. But I don't. Th I actually don't think that detracts from the force of what you're saying. That, that, that's a real problem. Yeah. Uh, were, were you next? I can't remember who was. Uh, oh, no, it was you. Last. Who was three? Right. You. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, Yeah, each different description indicates a different sense. That's right. Um, so long as the identity of the thing referred to by this description with the thing referred to by that description, so long as that identity is informative, you're going to have a different sense. No. <laughs> right. It's a good different description, and they're really different in that the identities are informative, then that's just the same thing as saying the sense is different. Yeah. yeah. However minor the difference is. Yeah. So yeah, I think that they're talking about the error of the answer. Yeah. 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 How are we going to get everybody tuned to the same description? There are cases, I mean, um, suppose we're having a discussion about the person who invented the wheel, yeah? And, I, and we say, okay, let's call a person who invented the wheel Bright. Yeah? Bright must have been brighter than the average caveman. You might say, I bet Bright was a person of high intelligence. Yeah? And you say, I bet Bright was female. Uh, and, yeah, and you, you could have a discussion about Bright. Yeah? You could say Bright must have existed about four million years ago. Um, bright was probably a taller than average height. Or maybe Bright was rather um, short and um, had a lot to prove. Or, <laughs> you, you see what I mean? <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah, I hope I can get away with that. <laughs> you, <laughs> you can have a lot of conjectures about Bright, yeah? But just the way the sign got onto the tracks there, it's always going to be the same description. Whoever invented the wheel. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a case. It's kind of an artificial case, but it could happen. But it's quite clear that we're all keeping the same description. Uh, uh, yeah. Right, the same extent can have different expressions, that's right. And um, remember what's going on is that uh, uh, the name Aristotle is expressing the sense. Yeah. Um, and that's to say, you could introduce, you, you could have, I mean, presumably um, in medieval France, they didn't pronounce the name Aristotle the way you and I do right now. Yeah. Um, uh, so that, that sign, there could have been a different sign connected up to the very same description and the very same reference. You see what I mean? So that's to say the same sense could have had different terms expressing it. And that is what happens in different languages. If you take in French Londres uh, and the English London, yeah, you get the same name there, but they could be perfectly well expressing just the same sense. Londres and London, yeah. That's what he means anyhow. Yeah. I think. <laughs> That's my okay. 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 Um, So there's a question how realistic this is. Oh, sorry, you, you, you were in line and you didn't get a raise a question. Carry on. So is, is this sense like a framework? Uh, framework. Framework. It's not a bad way to describe it. It's kind of abstract uh, and it's hard to get detail in just what it is and how it's meant to work. Um, the reason we spend so long on the uninformative and informative identities is that that seems to make it compelling that there must be such a thing as sense and then we just have to try and get what it is. But we've got a kind of description so far of its role, what kind of work this thing must be doing. But giving a direct characterization of it is turning out to be not that easy. Yeah. So framework in the sense of you've got an abstract description of what work it does. And now we say, but what is it, this thing that is doing that work? Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Okay, that's taking it for granted that descriptions are expressing the sense. Yeah, but I think the the, the problems people have been raising about um, can you really all have the same description associated with the name? Is that likely to happen? That's really what I mean here when I say how realistic is this that we should all have the same description associated with the name? As in the case of Bright, you can do that, but it's not obvious. That's very general. Um, look, we don't have very much time left, so let me. Uh, just get to some further problems with the notion of sense. Um, one puzzle is, when I said that about Bright, uh, whoever invented the wheel, um, then um, uh, it's not a, there I explain the name by using a description. So you can do that. But usually, you don't explain names in that way. Usually, you just say, look, here's the person. This is Sally. Yeah. You don't usually give someone a description defining the name. You do it in a different way. These kind of introductions that, you know, on campus this happens the whole time, that you're saying to people, look, this is Bill, this is Sally. Um, uh, you usually you explain names using demonstratives, not using description. And there's a basic puzzle about if you explain sense in terms of some associated representation. So if you take an informative identity like the one we had last time, so Percy Blakely is the Scarlet Pimpernel, then you explain the difference in sense here by saying, well, the representations associated with this name are different to the representations associated with that term. Then the trouble is, you're going to get problems about sense arising for the associated representations. Whatever's going on with the description, you're going to get puzzles of sense arising there. So you're just pushing the problem down one. What's the sense of a definite description? How do you explain what it comes to that a definite description has a particular sense? You only really postponed the problem. You shoved it off from one bit of language onto another. The problem's just going to keep going. We, we need this to bottom out somewhere. Um, and it's natural to wonder too about demonstratives like this and that. I mean, they are, Frege kind of ignores them, like they're really peripheral to language, but it's possible to think that terms like this and that, that's really the heart of the functioning of language, when you can say this and that and point to something, that they really, in their humble way, the things that do all the work in generating the significance of language. I mean, here we have our old friend, the tiger, um, hunting through the undergrowth. You see the tiger? I don't see, is that good a picture? Um, let's see. Look at that. Um, there's a tiger and you say, that tiger. Right? Now, if, if you say, um, that tiger looks hungry, well, what's the sense of the demonstrative? Is there some description you can give? seems to be a very clear case in which, in which there's some tape you have on the tiger, there's some way you're getting onto the thing as you spot it in the undergrowth. But is that a description? What kind of description would it be? I mean, really, what's letting you get onto that thing is the fact that you're perceiving it. It's the fact that you see it. That's what's characterizing your way of getting onto it. And if you take, you know, you see it again, and you say, that's that same tiger. This tiger is that tiger. Yeah, you can say that. Well, you get an informative identity. This tiger is that tiger. And you want to say, well, my take on the tiger here is different to my take on the tiger there. But all we've got from Frege is, well, maybe it's a description. But that doesn't sound right in this case. Because what would the description be? And what the other thing he says is, it has nothing to do with your ideas or sensations. But really, um, it seems to be your experience of the tiger that is letting you refer to it. It's the way you're experiencing the thing here is different to the way you're experiencing the thing there. That's why it's informative. So, 
at the end of the day, it's really hard to see how we can keep stuff about the psychology of the individual out of an account of the way in which the thing is being given to you. Because it's the way you experience the thing that seems to fix what way you're thinking of it. Okay, that's the end of the message for today. Uh, settle on Monday. <laughs>